Many times I have wondered about the sights of that city and all that my eyes shall behold. I will see all the wonders when I enter that city, there forever to be safe in his fold. Some morning you'll find me touring that city where the Son of God is the light. You'll find me there on the streets so pretty, made of gold so pure and so bright. With Jesus, the one who gave me the victory, who led me across the divide. Some morning you'll find me touring that city where with him I will ever abide. Here on earth we have troubles that to us seem so heavy, and in heaven no one will be sad. Mom and Dad will be singing, heaven's praise will be ringing for the dearest friend I ever had. Some morning you'll find me touring that city where the Son of God is the light. You'll find me there on the streets so pretty, made of gold so pure and so bright. With Jesus, the one who gave me the victory, who led me across the divide. Some morning you'll find me touring that city where with him I will ever abide, ever abide. All right, what good music today. John, that piano song, that was awesome, man. That was great, 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 great. Good sing. good way to play it, man, way to play it. You'll find our text this evening in the book of Job. We're going to begin reading in verse number 23 of Job, and then you'll find uh, most of our text will be Job 1 and Job 2. We'll be in Job 42 for a little bit, and, uh, but Job chapter 23, I'll read in a little bit, verse 8 down to verse 12. <clears throat> it's interesting that the book of Job is one of our, one of my maybe, favorite books of the Bible, and it's also one of the, I guess you could say, most misunderstood books of the Bible. Because why would God let such a great man of God suffer the way he suffered? And I don't know the answer to that, and I, but I do know that I appreciate having the book of Job because it helped me realize that the problems in life that I have really aren't so bad. And uh, because, you know, there's, Christian, there's Christians tonight struggling. There's people having a terrible time in their life, losing their family, their kids, house, job, money. And uh, but that just doesn't scratch the surface to what Job went through. And uh, Job remained faithful, and because of that, we have his story here written down in the Bible for us. Think about this, by all earthly standards, Job was a, was a good man. As a matter of fact, God even told Satan uh, in verse chapter, chapter 1, verse 8, the Lord said to Satan, Have thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and excheweth evil? God said, Are you talking about my servant Job? the best guy that I know. So even, even God points out to us and reminds us that uh, Job was a good man. So, so you've, you've got folks who teach this, that if you're a good person, if you'll be faithful, if you'll just do what's right, then nothing bad will ever happen to you. And don't you wish that was true? I think about Kathy and David Harper. Look what they're going through. And uh, some of the most faithful people in this church, and they're going through cancer right now. Miss Harper lost her legs going through all that problem, and they're just so faithful. And, uh, and it's a, but Job was a good man. And uh, like, like I say, good things do happen, uh, or bad things do happen to good people. And I wonder why that is. Why, why wouldn't God just say, okay, you live for me, you serve me, you're faithful to me, and because of that, I'm going to put a protective cocoon around you, and nothing bad will ever, ever happen to you. Well, if that was the case, folks, we would never have the book of Job. Look in chapter 23, verse 8 to verse 12. Kind of, it's kind of strange to begin right here in the story of, of Job, but let's do so. And this is the part of, of the book of Job where, where basically God and Job were having a conversation so look in verse 
chapter 23, verse 8, Job says this, Behold, I go forward, but he's not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, and I cannot see him. But he knoweth, I like verse 10, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps, his way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more necessary, uh, more than my uh, necessary food. I want to preach to you tonight a message entitled this, Triumph in Tribulations. If anybody who had tribulations, it was Job. But Job triumphed. How is that possible? How could that happen? We're going to see that in our story. We're going to be reminded once again in our story tonight about this great man of God, Job. Triumph in tribulation. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you today that uh, you're there right with us when we go through struggles and problems. Lord, you told us you'd never leave us or forsake us. And it's during the rough times in life that we sometimes question that. But tonight we can learn and be reminded from the book of Job, this great man of God, how it's true you never leave us or forsake us. And uh, while it seems like things on earth may not go our way, God, we understand that it's all for our, our benefit, it's all for your glory. And God, we ask you tonight, as we once again look through this great book of Job, I ask you, God, just to allow me to say what you'd want me to say, what your people need to hear. And Lord, don't let me say what you don't want me to say. And so, God, we pray that you might be, uh, you might be honored and glorified in this service, in this message. God, use me, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, the Bible says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. What that means is this. doesn't matter what kind of Christian you are, you're going to have problems. Uh, and, and like I said a minute ago, sometimes we're under the assumption that if we do right, if we live right, if we're faithful, if we don't uh, do things in our life that displease God, then, then why everything's going to happen to us, it's going to be good. It's going to be positive. Now, the Bible does tell us that all things work together for good, but that does not mean everything that happens is good. Listen, some great Christians have had cancer. Some great Christians have had financial problems. Some great faithful Christians have had all kind of, uh, of problems in their life. It doesn't mean they're not strong Christians. It just, mean that God, it just means that God sees something in them that they can handle it. This great man of, job, uh, of, of God, Job, could handle what God allowed to happen uh, in his life. But I want to tonight, I want to give you uh, probably pretty briefly three, three areas, three things from the story of Job that will help us, I believe will help us uh, once again to hear about this great man of God, Job. Look back now in Job chapter 1, maybe to a more familiar part of the book of Job. And look what the Bible says here. I want to give you, first of all tonight, Job's testimony. Job 1.1, 1, 1, the Bible says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Someone said this, we should live our lives in such a way that the preacher can tell the truth at our funeral. Someone else said we should live our lives in such a way that our family would not be ashamed to sell our parrot to the town gossip. Listen, that's, a, that's the kind of man of God Job was. Uh, Job had that testimony. He was a good man. He, the Bible says he feared God. Uh, he was perfect and upright. He eschewed evil. And if anybody was a good man, we can say it was Job. Remember now, this testimony, this is not Job writing about himself. This is God writing about Job. God tells us what he thinks about Job. God says, Job, my servant, is a, is a, he, he fears God. Uh, he's a perfect and upright man. He fears me. He is true with evil. And he goes on to tell Satan that there's none like him in all the earth. Listen, what if that could be said about you? What if God could say uh, when he's talking to Satan about you? You go ahead. You pick on Matt Grimes. He's a good man. You pick on my servant because there's none like him in all the earth. That's Job's testimony. Uh, he was a perfect and upright man. According to the uh, Bible dictionary, the words perfect and upright, they're synonymous in this passage. In other words, they mean the same thing. 
So what the Bible is telling us here is that Job was literally living a life uh, based upon being upright and being perfect, being mature as a Christian, being, uh, being holy as a Christian. Uh, he was a man that did right no matter what. He was a man of integrity. My, how we need some men of integrity. Uh, he was a man of character. Uh, he was a man that every man in here, we ought to strive to be just like Job. God says there's none like him in all the earth. Uh, he was perfect and upright. The Bible also says, God also says, that he fears God. He fears God in such a way that he has respect for God. He trusted God in such a way that whatever happened in his life, he continued trusting God. He feared God in such a way that it affected how he lived. And can I say to you tonight, listen, uh, when, you, when you fear God in such a way, it's not that you are afraid of God, but you ought to be afraid of God. Because God is a God of love, we know that. God is a God of compassion and mercy, and we praise God for that. But God's also a, a, a God uh, who's, who's judge. He's a God who's holy, and He has to punish sin. And because of that, we ought to be afraid. We ought to trust Him. We ought to fear Him. Uh, we ought to fear disappointing Him. We ought to fear disobeying Him. We ought to fear His judgment and His wrath because, like I said, yes, He loves us, but because He loves us, sometimes He must punish us, and because of that, we must fear Him. The Bible also tells us He eschewed evil. In other words, He hated evil. He had the right attitude about evil. Listen, He wanted nothing to do with evil. If there was a TV in Job's house when he's flipping through the channels, if there was something on there that shouldn't be on there, he flipped it, he turned it. And while he's scrolling through the internet, if something popped up he shouldn't see, he got rid of that. He, he, he eschewed evil. He didn't want to see it. He didn't want to taste it. He didn't want to look at it. He didn't want to smell it. He didn't want to see it. He's a man who hated evil. And can I say, God still wants us to hate evil. Psalm 97, 10, the Bible says, Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. Hebrews 1, 9 says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. When we see evil, we should avoid it. And while our society is going further and further away from what's right, listen, that means evil is going to be more and more. Listen, it's everywhere. It's all around us. It's on our TVs. It's on our radios. It's on our computers. It's on our iPad and pods and all those things. It's everywhere. And when it's here, we ought to avoid it. We ought to hate it. It ought to make us as sick as it makes God. Remember a few, uh, I guess it's been about a month ago now, this, this, uh, this sickening, wicked Miley Cyrus. And to have people that are Christians who name the name of Christ say something like this. Did you see what Miley Cyrus did on TV? No, I didn't. Because it's wicked and because it's evil, and to hear of a Christian who, who would watch it and who would say, oh, that's just terrible. She used to be such a sweet girl, and now look at what she's doing. I mean, that's Hannah Montana from the Disney Channel, and now she's acting like some kind of trash on TV. How terrible. I'd say, well, yeah, why were you watching it? Job eschewed evil. And because evil is more and more prevalent, listen, we've got to be more and more diligent. We've got to be more aware because we live in a day, listen, things are not getting more holy. Things are not getting more righteous. Uh, music is not getting more godly. Lifestyles are not getting more holy. Listen, we're not going uh, closer to God. We're going farther away from God. And the farther we go away from God, it's more and more evil. And that tells us Christians, those of us that, that love the Lord, we ought to hate evil. We ought to want nothing to do with it. We ought to turn the channel. We ought to turn off the computer and, and hate it, have the right attitude about evil. The Bible says Job has chewed evil. His testimony. Notice, notice next in Job 1 and 2, notice his tribulation. I don't know of anybody who has ever suffered the way Job suffered. 
But I read a story the other day. I read an article, maybe you guys read the same article, about a family who went through, I guess you could say, somewhat close to what Job went through. Let me read you this article. <clears throat> Pastor Dwayne Scott Willis and his wife Janet dearly loved the nine children God gave them. But at mid-morning on November 8, 1994, a fiery explosion on I-94 Milwaukee claimed the lives of their six youngest children. Within hours, the freak accident made national and international headlines. From behind guarded hospital doors came the good news concerning Scott and Janet. Their physical recovery from first and second degree burns would be complete. However, the most astonishing recovery became apparent as Scott and Janet displayed their emotional and spiritual stability. Milwaukee, the nation, and even the world looked on in amazement as eight days later the bereaved couple explained to the media how they could make it through such a sudden and horrible tragedy. And so the story goes on. It's going to give us basically the words that were said by the pastor, pastor Willis. This is in front of the media uh, with the world watching. Here's what was said. Don't forget they've just lost six children. First thing he said was this, our God is our praise. Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Janet and I want to praise and thank God. There's no question in our minds that God is good, and we praise Him in all things. God is a great God. Then there was a pause. And then he said, our trial was the accident. As far as the accident is concerned, I was looking at the road and was alert. Our baby was behind us, Ben was beside us and on the other side, and in the back there were four other children. They were all buckled in. I saw the object. I thought it was one of those blocks that maybe came off of a flatbed truck. The car in front of me swerved, and I knew I couldn't miss hitting the object. I thought it took, us on, I thought it took out the right tire, and I might roll the car. It was a split-second decision. When we hit the object, the rear gas tank exploded, taking the car out of control. I was able to grip the wheel and take the car out of the slide. We were sliding and the flames were coming up around the seat. I was in shock, a surprise, like, what is this? It was just roaring flames coming up on both sides. I was yelling to get out of the car. Janet and I had to consciously put our hands into the flames to unbuckle the seat belts and reach for the door handles. Janet fell out of the door while the car was still moving. Benny was in the midst of the burning uh, of the flames. His clothes were mostly burned off by the time he got out. The five youngest children who had been asleep died instantly. No sound was heard by Janet or me as we struggled to get out of the van. An unknown man took his shirt off his back to soak Benny's wounds. Another beat out the burning clothes on Janet's back. Benny died in intensive care around midnight. Our children are our pain. We believe this, and now don't forget, this is in front of the world watching this press conference. We believe children are a heritage of the Lord. We thank God for six precious children. Four rascally boys, a sweet girl, so much like her mother, a little baby just beginning to smile and grow. We understand they were given to the Lord, and we understand they weren't ours. They were His, and we were stewards of those children, and God took them back. He's the giver and taker of life. We must tell you that we hurt and sorrow as you parents would for your children. The depth of our pain is indescribable. The Bible expresses our feelings that we sorrow, but not as those without hope. And then he says, our confidence is God's word. What gives us our firm foundation for our hope is the Bible. The truth of God's word assures us that Ben, Joe, Sam, Hank, Elizabeth, and Peter are in heaven with Jesus Christ. And we know based upon the Word of God where they are, our strength rests in the Word of God. The Bible is sure and gives us confidence. Everything God promises is true. And the article goes on to talk about how the, 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 the dozens of people by that testimony trusted Christ as their Savior. And so you think about this. This is a terrible thing to happen. And yes, it's a terrible thing to happen. But think about, they turned their tragedy, they turned their tribulation into triumph, just like this great man of, man of God, Job, did. Think about what happened to Job. Notice, first of all, uh, under his tribulation, think about his financial trials. Look in chapter 1, verse 13. And there was a day when his... When his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house, 
And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses fitting uh, beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. The first attack that God allowed to happen to Satan was an attack on his finances. Because there was a day, listen, when Job had want of nothing, and now Job has Nothing, financially speaking, it's a great possibility that in the time when Job lived that he could have been the richest man in the entire earth. And in one day, his wealth was gone. Between the fire and the Sabaeans and the Chaldeans, Job lost every bit of his wealth. He lost what he'd worked for his whole life. His livestock was gone in the blink of an eye, and his wealth was completely destroyed. Listen, just a few minutes ago, Job had everything And now he's got nothing. And I'm sad to say that if that happened to most of us, that right there would have been enough to cause us to quit serving God. God, how could you allow my finances to be in the shape they're in? God, how could you allow this to happen to me? I've been working hard and putting money away and saving and doing this and being smart. How could you allow this to happen? And that right there, most Christians would have said, that's it. But the story continues. Oh, he had financial trials. He also had family trials. Look in verse 18. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now Job loses his children. Can you imagine a tornado coming through your neighborhood, wiping your house out, and your kids are gone? Uh, I can't imagine that. But the Bible tells us that his ten children, listen, seven, dungeons, three, seven sons and three daughters were gathered together at the oldest son's house, and, uh, and they were there, maybe they were watching Tennessee and Florida, I don't know what they were doing, but they were gathered there together. And the Bible says that this, hurricane, this tornado comes and wipes out the house, and all the children are gone, And think about this. That night when Job went to bed, he had ten children they loved very much. And the next morning, he's got ten funerals to plan. Family trials. I don't know about you, but if I lost all my money, it wouldn't take very long, for one thing. I make it handle that. But if I lose my kids, I don't know if I could handle that. But that right there is enough to get some Christians to quit serving God. But the story continues. He had financial trials. He had family trials. He also, in Job chapter 2, had physical trials. Look in verse 7. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown, and he took him a potsherd to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. And then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity, Job, for crying out loud, If you'll just curse God, you'll die, and all your pain will be over with. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? Shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. He's lost his wealth. He's lost his family, and now he's lost his health. He's in terrible pain. Can you imagine having uh, uh, boils and sores? The Bible says from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot. His body was covered with these, with these, with these sores, and he's in such misery that he takes a, a, a clay vessel, and he breaks the clay vessel and takes a potsherd and begins to scrape himself with all because he's in so much pain and so much misery. And his wife looks at him and says, Honey, this is ridiculous. What are you doing? Why don't you just curse God? He'll kill you, and all your suffering and all your pain will be over with. Listen, how's that for a supportive wife? 
It'd be nice to hear, honey, it's okay. We'll get through this together. But no, not her. He lost his wealth, his children, his health. He's been rejected by his wife. And right here, right here you would think, okay, that's enough, Job. Uh, surely you've had enough now. Surely now you'll, you'll, you'll denounce your faith. Surely now, Job, you'll turn back on God. He's allowed this to happen to you. Surely, surely now, Job, that's enough to take you over the breaking edge. Surely you've had enough now. Surely you've had enough pain. Surely you're going to quit on God. Surely you're going to do it now. But the Bible says at the end of verse 10, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. In all this pain, in all this sadness, in all this suffering, in all this loss, in all this misery, Job remained faithful. That leads me to a few questions. What's it going to take to get us to quit serving God? If we lose our life savings, will we quit then? If we lose our family, will we quit then? If we lose our health, will we quit then? If we lose the support of our wife, will we quit then? Listen, as terrible as Job's past couple hours have been, we wouldn't blame him one single bit for saying, God, why me? God, you should have picked somebody stronger. God, you should have picked somebody who could take it because I just can't take it. But listen, Job didn't serve God because of what God did for him. Uh, that's what Satan thought. Job served God because of what God's already done for him. His tribulation, his testimony, and notice his triumph. Look over in verse 42. I mean chapter 42. <clears throat> It's not unusual to see what appears to be a tragedy to those around us turn into triumph. It happens all the time. And we don't always understand it, but we do know we've learned in our life that God uses these trials and tragedies to shape us. Like someone said, like a sculptor uses a hammer and chisel to take the stone and turn it into a masterpiece. Or a potter uses kneading and pressure to turn a lump of clay into a usable vessel. These trials and tribulations are there to, to shape us and form us into not what we want to be, but into what God wants us to be. I read another article this week about how they make Steinway pianos. The Steinway piano has been preferred by keyboard masters such as Rachmaninoff, Horowitz, Van Cliburn, and Liszt. And for good reason. It's a skillfully crafted instrument that produces a phenomenal sound, this article says. Steinway pianos are built the exact same way they were built 150 years ago when Mr. Steinway began his company. Listen to this. It takes 200 different craftsmen and 12,000 parts just to build one Steinway piano. And the most crucial part of the process is the rim bending where 18 layers of maple are bent around an iron press to create the shape of the Steinway Grand. Five coats of lacquer are applied, and it's hand-rubbed to give the Steinway its outer glow it's known for. The instrument then goes to the pounder room, where each key is tested 10,000 times to ensure its quality and durability. It goes through some kind of process, doesn't it, to get it to where it sounds just right. And so I thought about this. You know, we Christians, whatever our age is, however long we've been saved, do you realize God is handcrafting us? He, he, he has to bend us sometimes and has to, to move us and squeeze us and, and uh, put us through the pounder room sometimes to get us to where, oh yes, we glow for Him, but that He can use us for His will and His honor and His glory. And think about Job, as a great as a man of God he was, and as great a Christian as he was before the trial, and as blessed as he was before the trial, have you forgotten how blessed he was after his trial? Look in 42, verse 1 through verse 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything. 
and that no thought can be withholden from me. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understand not. Things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Notice he uses the word wonderful. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself, I repent in dust and ashes. In Job's triumph, notice first of all that Job is enlightened. The word enlightened means that Job has learned from the trials he endured. The saddest part about a trial, yes, it's the loss and the pain and the misery and the suffering, but the most tragic part of a trial is the fact that we as a Christian don't learn from what's happened. Job, the Bible says, Job says, Oh, I've heard thee. He says, But now I can see ye with my eyes. And I wonder if it took this trial, this terrible calamity to get Job to not only listen to God, but now to see God with his own eyes. He was enlightened. He was also enriched in verse 12 and to verse 13. Look what the Bible says there. So the Lord blessed, this is great, the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke and a box, and 1,000 she-asses, and he also had seven sons and three daughters. That's interesting. Because when the trial, before the trial happened, he had half that. Now he's got double what he had before. He had 10 children, now he's got 20 children. Yes, 10 are in heaven, he's got 20 children. He had 14 of this, and 1,000 of this, and 600 of this. And now he's got the same exact thing he had before. Listen, he went through this trial, he suffered greatly for God. God used Satan to deliver these terrible things to him. But the whole time he sinned not, he charged not God foolishly. He remained faithful to God, he trusted God, he didn't blame God, he learned from God, and as a result... God blessed the latter end of his life more than the beginning. But what if, what if Job would have, would have behaved the way we probably would have behaved and said, God, that's enough. Why me? Why couldn't you pick on somebody else? God, that's it. I don't want to see you. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want you to bless me. I'm tired of this. Why me? God, I'm leaving you. I'm not going to serve you because how can you say you love me when all these things have happened to me? And if Job would have done that, the story of Job would have been a terrible, terrible ending. But you see, Job turned his tribulation into triumph because he remained faithful no matter what. He served God no matter what. Triumph in tragedy. How about you tonight? I would ask you, are you going through what Job went through? And the answer would be no, because you're not. None of us are. We'll ever be close to that. But what if it happens to you? How will you respond? Will you turn your triumph or your tribulation into triumph or will you turn it into defeat? Job turned his tribulation into in the triumph. And can I say, we are much better off for it because we've got the great book of Job to encourage us and help us as we go through things like that. Triumph in tragedy. Please stand, we'll pray.